So we're going to talk about articulations. Articulations are joints. This is where two bones of your skeleton come together in order to make a motion happen. So the types of articulations are synarthroses. These are immovable joints. Antherthroses, these are slightly movable joints, and diarthroses, these are freely movable joints. And we're going to talk about each of these in turn. Synarthroses are immovable, and what that means is that the bones are fused, but they started out as two separate bones. So the sutures of the skull are examples of synarthroses. So this would be the coronal, the lamboid, the sagittal, all of those are examples of synarthroses. Because again, remember articulations are where two bones come together. And since these are two bones, not only coming together, but fusing together, they count as an articulation. Antherthroses Antherthroses are slightly movable joints. These would be your vertebrae and your coxal bones. So the sacroiliac joint and the pubic symphysis, those are really important examples of antherthrosis because as we walk, we need a little bit of flex in our hips to act as kind of a shock absorber as we take steps because there's a lot of pressure um, because of our uh, vertical walking stature. And then diarthroses are where we're going to spend most of our time. Um, these are freely movable joints, and the biggest thing that characterizes them is that they have a synovial cavity. This means they are also sometimes referred to as synovial joints. The synovial cavity is filled with synovial fluid, and the synovial fluid works with articular cartilage to reduce the friction between the bones as the joint moves. So this is really important for maintaining um, good, healthy working joints is the maintenance of that synovial fluid. So let's get some basics down about the way synovial joints look. So this is the shoulder specifically, but it's gonna stand in for all uh, synovial joints, all diarthritic joints, because all of them are going to have, they're not all going to look like this, obviously, but they're all going to have these same basic structures when we talk about things like the bursa, or when we talk about articular cartilage, or the synovial membrane, or the synovial cavity, which they're calling a joint cavity here, but it's the same thing. It's the cavity that contains the synovial fluid. And um, sometimes that synovial cavity is also called the bursa. Um, those often get interchanged with each other. So just think about that um, as you're kind of identifying different aspects of this diagram. So a couple of things. The synovial membrane is there to produce the synovial fluid. So similar to what we saw with like our mucous membranes, it's a tissue that is producing a fluid and releasing that fluid into the surrounding space. And you can imagine this humerus moving and kind of um, moving in all directions. And you can see how that synovial fluid is going to produce a friction, friction um, reduced surface for that bone to move around in. And then um, if we should have an injury where you know the synovial fluid is reduced, then we still have the articular cartilage to protect. And if things really get bad, um, we're gonna talk about what happens then when we get to joint injuries. Um, so this also has a separate bursa sac up here. Um, when there's a separate bursa sac in a synovial joint, um, that um, is producing more synovial fluid. Sometimes that fluid is pushed into the joint. Sometimes the bursa sac is just synovial fluid filled and it provides a cushion in a specific direction. So you can see here that this is the synovial cavity is um, producing a lovely cushion around the head of the humerus, 
But if we should do something like we need to put our arm above our head, we might need more cushion as it comes against the acromion of the scapula. So we would have we would have that extra cushioning there as the humerus comes up against the acromion of the scapula. So just something to keep in mind as we kind of look at that. So remember the bursa, to make sure you have in your notes, um, this can sometimes be what we call this uh, synovial cavity or the joint cavity. Sometimes the bursa gets used for that as well. But if it, there is a separate bursa sac in a joint, it is used to make more synovial fluid to act as additional cushioning. So just something to consider there. So let's talk about the types of diarthroses. There are six types. There are gliding joints. This is what we see with the tarsals and the carpals. This is where the bones slide against each other. This is sometimes called a plane joint. Um, and we're not talking like an airplane, we're talking about a mathematical plane where the two surfaces of the bone are uh, sliding against each other. Then we have hinge joints. This is what we see with the elbows and the knees. This is where it's like a hinge and it opens and closes. Um, this is also what our interphalangeal joints are. So that would be between the sections of the phalanges in both the fingers and the toes. Then we have pivot joints. This is where we have a uh, on a dontoid process and that allows for the spinning of a joint um, in order to um, create a rotational movement. Um, this is also like how you produce that parade wave where you're rotating your radius around the ulna. Then we have the condyloid joint. This creates an oval shaped movement. Um, and allows for kind of a um, a more um, smooth range of motion. Um, some examples are things like um, where your wrist comes in um, to your arm. You have the ability to kind of um, pull your hand up, but you can also fold it down. Saddle joints, this is where each bone has an indent in it and it allows for kind of a rocking motion in two directions. Um, this is what you have at the base of your thumb with the trapezium and this is what allows your thumb to have quite a bit of range of motion, especially compared to the hinge joints in our phalanges. Ball and socket, this is what you see in the hip and shoulder. Um, this is where you have a ball-shaped surface that fits into a um, rounded depression on another bone and allows for that full range of motion there. And then here we have just the examples. Um, you have the, I like this diagram because it has these um, like just mechanical ones that show you like the range of motion of these joints without it necessarily being um, hard to see because of the structure of the bone. So I really like this diagram uh, for that reason. But then you can kind of see examples of where they're found as well. So just um, a quick little diagram to kind of help you memorize those diarthroses. And then, so what are some things that can affect the functionality of a diarthritic joint? We have um, the structure or shape of bones. Everybody is an individual. And so while we have a basic understanding of how these bones are shaped, everybody's skeleton is slightly different. So, um, you might have a bone that has a unique like little bump on it that affects the movement of your joint. 
the strength of ligaments. Um, if ligaments are really loose, they're not, uh, they don't have a lot of tension in them, then you might see a situation where um, the bones are really far apart and um, it allows for more flexibility in that joint. Arrangement and tension of muscles, similar to what we saw with the ligaments. If we have really loose um, tendons, we might have more range of motion in a diarthritic joint. Apposition, um, there are certain joints that have much, uh, limited range of motion um, just because there are anatomical structures that prevent that. Like if you think about your shoulder, that is a ball and socket joint and you have a huge amount of motion in your shoulder. But if you think about your femur, you also have a ball and socket joint there, but you can't, you know, you can pinwheel your arm, but you can't pinwheel your leg. Um, and that is an example of apposition. The greater trochanter of the femur prevents you from pinwheeling your femur. And then hormones. Um, particularly during the menstrual cycle and during um, pregnancy, um, actually relax the tendons, specifically around trying to loosen up the pubic symphysis. Um, we actually see the pubic symphysis expand during pregnancy, and that is in order to enlarge the birth canal um, and to provide more flexibility in the hips for birth to take place. This is also why we have that characteristic uh, pregnancy waddle, um, because the pubic bones are actually spreading apart and it actually affects the pregnant person's gait. Um, they, their hips are now wider and they're, as a result, their legs are displaced. And so that's what leads to that characteristic pregnancy waddle that we associate with pregnancy. And that is going to round out our notes to start articulations. Next, we're going to move into articular movements.